I'd like to tell you a story. When I was in my late teens, my parents took in a lodger. He was a master's student, well-dressed, well-spoken and fun to be around, despite being nearly 10 years older than I was at the time. One day we were having a chat and he told me something that amazed me. He said to me, do you know what happens when I ring up for jobs? I speak to the HR person and tell them about having been in the army and my other experience and my qualifications and they're all enthusiastic. But as soon as I say, my name is Sanji Aziz, I can hear the shutters come down. I didn't really get it. What do you mean? I asked. And he said, the HR person will suddenly become hesitant asking a load more questions about my qualifications and backgrounds. Sometimes they will remember some criteria I didn't fit, or else they'll say, they'll send me an application form, and it will either never arrive, or it will arrive after the closing date for the job. Like I said, I was amazed. What do you do then? I asked. He just laughed and said, I'll ring up another company. Although I was shocked at the time, I've seen research to show that Sanjit was not alone in this experience. It had never occurred to me, this kind of thing goes on in Britain, that just having an Asian name could put you at a disadvantage in the jobs market. Having a British name is just one thing that can give people a small gain in some areas of life. The thing about small gains is that though each gain by itself might be small, when they're combined, they can add up to a big advantage for some people in society. And one which, like with me and Sanji, those who have that advantage can be totally oblivious to it. In many ways, men tend to have an advantage over women. Note this is a net gain. The advantages of being male, in general, outweigh the disadvantages, so that men tend to be overrepresented in the most powerful positions in society and women in the least powerful positions. If you don't conform to gender stereotypes, that disadvantage can be even greater. As I've just said, the same goes for race. I've put race there in inverted commas, as race is a highly contested concept, but you can think of it as a visible marker of ethnicity. When you look at the research, you can see many examples of how being from a visible ethnic minority puts a person at a disadvantage compared to those in the majority ethnic groups. A similar thing applies to ability and disability, although here it's even more complex as those with invisible disabilities, such as mental health challenges or chronic pain, can face prejudices because they, quote, don't look disabled. Sexuality is even more complex. If you're heterosexual, you are rarely likely to experience your sexuality being challenged or questioned. Whereas if you're a lesbian or a gay man, you'll often face situations where either people assume that you're heterosexual or you face direct discrimination on the basis of your sexuality. This can be even more challenging if you don't fit into the neat heterosexual-homosexual divide, as human sexuality has a wide range of expressions. Finally, we live in a deeply class-based society. It's not simply that upper-class and middle-class people have more money, it's that the social capital that comes from belonging to a more powerful socio-economic group hands you a wide variety of advantages. So far, we've only considered these social groups in isolation. But what happens when we combine them? If we see the different social fats as being like rungs of a ladder, we can see that being a white, heterosexual, middle-class, able-bodied man adds up to a significant cumulative privilege in society when compared to a black, disabled, working-class lesbian. The idea of privilege is one that really needs a video all on its own, but for now, consider it to be the unearned benefits gained simply by the social categories a person belongs to. This really comes to the fore when we're faced with a barrier to success. Even if you are in all the most privileged groups in society, success nearly always takes some effort. But the hard fact is, if you fall into multiple categories that are less privileged, then success will require a much higher level of effort. So where does this leave us? The most important thing to take away from this video is that life is not a tug of war between disadvantaged groups over whose oppression is worst. When oppressed groups in society turn on each other, this only serves to keep the powerful in their position of power. 
instead of creating a hierarchy of oppression, all oppressed groups and their allies in other groups can work together to create a fairer society for all. But how? There's an old joke, how do you eat an elephant? To which the answer is, one small piece at a time. It's the same with oppression. We need to take small steps and work on many different levels using a wide variety of strategies to ensure that all those steps of the ladder are equal, regardless of which social groups a person belongs to. This is no easy task and it's something I intend to return to in later videos. So in conclusion, I'd like to leave you with two core beliefs that I think are central to anti-oppressive practice. The first is a quote from Bishop Desmond Tutu, who said, If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So regardless of which group you are in, choose the side of those with the least power. The second comes from the writer Max Licardo. And Max Licardo says, No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. No one person can eliminate oppression in society. But we can choose to do lots of small things in order to reduce the levels of inequality and oppression in society. These are the themes that I hope to return to in later videos. So thank you for watching and I hope you have a greater understanding now of some of the basics of anti-oppressive practice.